How's the war in Ukraine changing the future of combat? Right now, we're seeing the simultaneous use of World War II era artillery and machine guns, mass produced consumer electronics, and some of the most advanced weapon systems in the world. At the same time, open source intelligence is making it so the whole world is watching. You actually can feel this battlefield, I think, in a way that I could feel the battlefield in Iraq. General David Petraeus led the 101st Airborne Division during the invasion of Iraq. He then rose to the rank of four star general taking command of U.S. and coalition forces in Iraq in 2007, U.S. Central Command in 2008, and then U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan in 2010. Afterward, he served as director of the CIA. His upcoming book, Conflict, The Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine, is set to be released in October. General Petraeus sat down with RDI to discuss Russia's war in Ukraine, which is mixing decades-old weapons and emerging smart technologies like none before it. Thank you for joining me, General Petraeus. What has surprised you about how the war in Ukraine has played out? Well, there have been a number of surprises from the very beginning, uh, one of which is that it's pretty clear that the Russians didn't take advantage of their months uh, being deployed on the borders of Ukraine and Russia proper and also in Belarus to actually achieve basic standards of uh, how to conduct movement, maneuver, uh, integrate combined arms and so forth. And so that was a bit of a surprise. If you'd given General Hodges and me a few months uh, out with our troops, I think we could have done a bit better than that. Beyond that, the campaign design was uh, very, very poor. It was unfocused. Uh, the command and control obviously has been very much wanting. That's why generals kept getting killed in the beginning. Their radios don't work. They get jammed. The modernization of Russian forces, which had been trumpeted by Putin and others, clearly had not been that extensive. Uh, what you really see is a, a war that is reminiscent of what the Cold War would have looked like had it turned hot, say, in the late 1980s before the wall came down and the Soviet Union dissolved. Um, you've also seen, of course, uh, very impressive leadership from President Zelensky, uh, very reassuring, positively Churchillian. Uh, there was great NATO unity before the invasion. I was at the Munich Security Conference uh, and left just a few days before the invasion was launched last year. There was great unity, but what has followed has been uh, very impressive. Uh, the sheer amount of arms, ammunition, other assistance, uh, and also the sanctions and so forth have been very, very substantial, led by the United States. The administration doing a very impressive job uh, in that regard, noting that occasionally that I'd like to have seen some decisions made a bit faster. Um, so again, a number of different surprises. What did not surprise me was the tenacious fighting of the Ukrainian forces. I'd visited Ukraine on a number of occasions, literally back in the days of the Soviet Union. Uh, and then multiple times since then, I was at the last uh, Yalta Economic uh, Strategy Forum uh, when it was still in Yalta in 2013 and have been back a number of times since then and visited the front lines not long after President Zelensky was elected uh, several years ago. And I was very impressed then by how far the Ukrainian forces had come uh, over the previous, say, six or seven years. The professionalism, uh, the increased technical competence and all the rest of that is a result of uh, efforts by Ukrainian forces themselves and also support from the US and NATO countries was very evident. And we've seen that even more since then. And of course, we've also seen the mobilization of an entire country. Uh, all of Ukraine is engaged in this. Uh, President Zelensky early on after saying that he didn't want a ride, he wanted ammunition, also then declared that no Ukrainian males would leave the country. This is Ukraine's war of independence, and Ukrainians are acting that way. And, and again, that's very, very impressive. Not unexpected, but reassuring to see how that has played out. Um, so those, I think, are the major uh, developments that we have seen. Uh, I actually did predict prior to the invasion that Russia would not take Kyiv, would not topple the government, would not control uh, Kyiv. Um, and that did bear out, uh, as has, again, uh, the very impressive fighting, not just of Ukrainian forces, but of all Ukrainian citizens.
So will the war in Ukraine affect how war is conducted in the future? Well, that's a good question because I'm just finishing a book with the great British historian and biographer Andrew Roberts that's titled Conflict, uh, The Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine, and the final chapter is on the future of warfare. And the truth is that the war in Ukraine is not the war of the future. Uh, you see some glimpses of the war of the future. You see some moderately capable drones, but not even as capable as the ones that we had starting in Iraq, say, 15 years ago. Uh, you see some moderate range precision munitions provided by the United States for the use with the multiple launch rocket system that we've given to Ukraine. But again, they're limited to about 150 kilometers at this point in time, uh, not the kind of long range systems at possibly hypersonic speeds that would be a feature of uh, a future conflict between uh, pure competitors, uh, as the U.S. term is used. Um, and you don't see many of the other features of the future of warfare. Again, you see glimpses of this. You see these modestly capable drones being used very effectively by the Ukrainians, in particular for targeting purposes, uh, giving a glimpse of what is possible in the future, but again, at a very limited range, all line of sight communications and so forth, as opposed to the very long range satellite communication connected um, the capabilities of the future that will for the first time truly operationalize an old slogan from the Cold War days that went, uh, if it can be seen, it can be hit. If it can be hit, it can be killed. Now, the truth is actually we couldn't make that a reality in Cold War days. It was more aspirational than realistic because we couldn't see all that well. We didn't have all of the intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance platforms that we have nowadays. Uh, we didn't have the precision munitions, uh, long range precision munitions that we have nowadays. Uh, and therefore we couldn't make that a reality. Uh, a war of the future, you would see that. If you can see everything, you can hit everything and at increasing speeds and therefore you can kill everything. So again, I think it's very important to recognize that there are real limits to what we see in Ukraine being applied to the future. Uh, although there is one feature that is truly different uh, than before, uh, and that is the presence of smartphones, access to the internet and social media that makes this war vastly more transparent uh, vastly more accessible to those who are willing to mine uh, open source intelligence as it is termed. But otherwise, in large measure, as I mentioned earlier, this is much more what the Cold War would have looked like had it turned hot in the late 1980s. In fact, now you're seeing the Russians falling back on almost World War II era tanks. They're bringing T-54s and T-55s out of mothballs because the losses to their T-62s, T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s, and so forth, have been so enormous. And most of those systems were around back uh, in the Cold War days, just as are the systems, again, on, on the Ukrainian side, even those that are being given to them now from the West. By and large, we had those capabilities. We already had the uh, M1A2 uh, Abrams tanks with the 120 millimeter gun that the Ukrainians will presumably receive. We already had the Leopards that had the 120 millimeter gun on them as well. So again, um, this is very much a throwback rather than a glimpse at the future, despite some capabilities that do provide uh, some insights as to what future conflict might be. You mentioned open source intelligence and the fact that this is something very different from past conflicts. How important is it? Well, it's been important in a host of different ways. Um, in certain respects, it's used on the battlefield. And again, that's a glimpse, if you will, at the future, because Ukrainian forces have incredible IT skills. Uh, they have been able to use Find My iPhone features or to uh, locate, geolocate um, cell phone signals uh, for targeting purposes. Uh, they've used some very sophisticated techniques uh, again, in the EW spectrum, uh, in the internet, uh, cyberspace, and so forth. And, and again, that is a glimpse at the future. Um, but it's also been revolutionary in terms of what you and I can find out 
um, in particular because there are sites that aggregate this and very rigorously uh, capture the details. So you have oryx.com, I believe it's a Dutch-based um, open source website that literally catalogs and validates the uh, destruction or abandonment or capture of, for example, Russian armored systems uh, with incredible detail, the, the, the make and model of them, if you will, all the way, and, and then various other systems as well. Um, you have other sites that very precisely uh, show the progress on the battlefield. You have still others, the Institute for the Study of War, on whose board I sit and where there is the Petraeus Center for Emerging Leaders, uh, they do, I think, the best nightly update. Every night is quite lengthy. I distill it for LinkedIn. Uh, and so you have that which we did not have in the past. In the past, you had uh, selected reports from the battlefield by embedded reporters and others. In this case, again, everyone on the battlefield with a smartphone is a potential reporter. Um, if they have access to the internet, which generally they do, they can upload the pictures, the videos, the assessments, the observations real time. Uh, and if you can then aggregate that, make sense of it, and plenty of organizations can, I use a data aggregator, data miner, uh, to help me with that, uh, in addition to these other sites that I mentioned, and actually a number of others, um, you actually can feel this battlefield, I think, in a way that I could feel the battle in battlefield in Iraq when I was uh, a commander there as a two, three, and four star, or Afghanistan as a four star, and so forth, because you were living it. Uh, but here, you know, we're not there, and yet we have incredible information about what is going on there, way beyond the traditional media, which in and of themselves have increased dramatically as well. We would now, I think, assess that traditional media includes a variety of online-only publications, for example. Uh, but it goes way beyond that. And that is a very dramatic difference uh, from even the wars in which I was privileged to fight in the immediate uh, aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. In your opinion, will the war in Ukraine affect U.S. strategy or military production priorities? Well, it is already affecting uh, production levels in the United States and NATO countries. One of the big outcomes of a variety of the different multilateral meetings um, and even fora like the Munich Security Conference has been a recognition, a broad recognition by NATO leaders that we have to increase the production of a variety of different uh, types of ammunition and so forth, even some major end items, given the extraordinary rate of consumption on the battlefield in Ukraine. And so that is actually happening. The U.S., for example, the last I saw is trying to double the monthly production of 155 millimeter heavy artillery rounds uh, and a variety of other rounds, again, that are being consumed at a high rate uh, on this particular battlefield. Um, as to the strategy, I think it gives some insights into the way to harden the country that might be applicable elsewhere the so-called hedgehog or the poison frog or whatever the analogy that you want to use out of the metaphorical image um, that, again, could be useful in other locations. And beyond that, I think there, there will be a conviction out of this that when this is all done, and it will at some point be all done, and I tend to think there will be some kind of negotiated resolution at some point, uh, I can't tell you when, because a great deal depends on whether or not Russian forces begin to crumble and collapse in the face of the anticipated Ukrainian offensives that we'll see in the months that lie ahead. But, but when that happens, I think there will be recognition that Ukraine needs an ironclad security guarantee, that our sensitivities to Moscow's concerns about, for example, NATO membership for Ukraine or some other kind of security arrangement for Ukraine, uh, those didn't turn out too well. Uh, we did actually accede to Moscow. We did not take Ukraine uh, into NATO. Uh, and I think with hindsight, there's a conclusion that, look, we took the Baltic states in. We took a number of other former Soviet republics into NATO. 
none of them has been attacked by the so by by the uh, Russian Federation. Um, yet Ukraine, which we did not do that for, uh, was vulnerable and was attacked, uh, and we can't allow that to happen again in the future. So I think there will be some effort, uh, very clearly, to establish again a very robust security arrangement for Ukraine, even. Uh, as there is also a very substantial effort to help Ukraine rebuild, whether that's funded by frozen Russian funds or by those plus uh, US EU G7 will remains to be seen. But the numbers are very substantial. The latest estimate is well over $400 billion. Keep in perspective that the Marshall Plan in the wake of World War II, uh, by contrast, was only about 110 or $120 billion in today's uh, currency. Uh, so that's a very, very considerable amount. Um, but without a security guarantee, I don't think it can actually succeed. It certainly won't attract outside investment without that kind of guarantee. I want to talk a bit about this idea of a poison frog or a hedgehog in military defense. What are lessons that Taiwan could be taking from the defense of Ukraine? Well, I think those are among them. Um, that kind of, again, analogy, metaphor, what have you, um, as a way of contributing to deterrence. Because obviously what we want to happen in the Indo-Pacific is to avoid what the U.S. National Security Advisor has described as severe competition, uh, the relationship between the United U.S. and China turning into a severe confrontation. Uh, and the way to do that, obviously, is to ensure that the elements of deterrence are sound, obviously, to have conversation and dialogue that needs to begin again to have, if you can, uh, security reassurances, whatever is possible. Uh, and there will be efforts to resume that kind of dialogue uh, in the months that lie ahead, just as we had dialogue with the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War. Not saying that this is a Cold War and that analogy would be very flawed in any case. But the key is to ensure that the potential adversary's assessment of our capabilities uh, is one that uh, doesn't leave any doubts and that the potential uh, assessment of our willingness to employ those is also very solid. Is China learning from this war? Will it affect their priorities or strategy going forward? Well, I'm sure that they are identifying lessons from this war. China, Chinese leaders have always very assiduously studied history. They have studied in particular uh, the history of the Soviet Union and Russia. Uh, so I'm sure that they are seeking to glean lessons from this war. What they might be, I can't tell you. And of course, it's by no means over. Uh, and it would be very premature to draw conclusions based on where we are right now. The outcome does matter in a host of different ways, including in this respect. But certainly there are efforts to take lessons from this, just as there are efforts to take lessons from it on the U.S. side, noting the limitations, as I mentioned earlier, given that this is not the systems of the future. It's not even the systems of the present um, in terms of range of precision munitions, the uh, fifth generation fighters, the, all the capabilities that, say, the US or the major uh, Western powers can bring to bear. But sure, there are lessons. I think everyone is trying to study this and take lessons from it, just as we have always done that. Think of the intensive study of the Yom Kippur War, for example. Uh, after that took place and the implications out of that about having to do with anti-tank guided missiles against armor, et cetera, et cetera. It's been widely reported that the Russian military is having significant issues uh, maintaining weapon stocks on the battlefield. Are we witnessing Russia being weakened for a generation or are they going to remain a threat to global security going forward? It's probably a bit of both. Um, certainly, their conventional capabilities have been dramatically degraded. Uh, reportedly, have lost at least half of their tank fleet uh, without the capacity to replace it. Uh, missile stocks are dwindling. Uh, one of the reports in the last 24 hours or so is that it appears that they can only conduct missile attacks twice a week now instead of every night. Certainly, they still have Iranian drones and others to cause additional casualties and damage to infrastructure uh, and so forth. Uh, but no, they have been dramatically weakened. I think that their conventional forces have been set back at least a generation or so. 
uh, in the military industrial complex uh, does not appear remotely capable of spooling up, if you will, to replace what it is that they have lost. In fact, uh, it's hard pressed even to repair what has been lost. Um, so in that regard, I think um, there's no question, uh, but Russia still has lots of other capabilities, including uh, the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Um, size doesn't necessarily matter there beyond a certain point, to be sure. We obviously have a very substantial nuclear force as well, and it's a triad and more than adequate for deterrence. Uh, but again, that capability is there. Uh, we should be concerned about the possibility of it being used. We should take measures to ensure uh, that Vladimir Putin is deterred from employing it, and those measures have been taken. Um, U.S. leaders have, for example, said that there were publicly that there would be uh, catastrophic consequences for such use. Uh, and in fact, the Chinese and Indian leaders have cautioned Putin uh, against using nuclear weapons. So there should be a global effort, as there has been, frankly, to ensure that that component of his military power isn't employed. Beyond that, let's not overlook the continuing economic capability of Russia. It still is one of the largest natural gas and crude oil and coal producers in the world. There are a number of countries in the world still willing to buy that at a considerable discount, to be sure. But still, the world does need uh, that oil, gas, and coal. Uh, and it also produces strategic minerals and agricultural products that other countries are willing to buy as well. So Russia will be dramatically diminished in terms of its conventional military capabilities. But it's by no means uh, a country that should be counted out. Earlier, you referenced the importance of drones to the future of warfare. Could you speak more to why they're going to be so important going forward? Well, one of the biggest of the big ideas about transformation of the U.S. forces in particular is that we are um, transitioning from a small number of very large and incredibly capable, heavily manned and exorbitantly expensive platforms, the most substantial of which, of course, is an aircraft carrier, but also other major maritime combatants, uh, aircraft, the F-35, main battle tanks, et cetera. And we're going to transition to a larger number of much smaller unmanned systems. And it's not just the drones as we currently think of them in the sky. Uh, it's on the surface of the ocean. It's subsea. It's on the ground. Uh, it's in space, even in cyberspace. Uh, and these are systems, some of which will be remotely piloted, others of which will be algorithmically driven. Some may be together with manned systems, some may be completely apart from them. Is a transition, a transformation that will take a very long time, and we're not going to give up all of the small number of large platforms by any means. Those are still hugely, incredibly useful in a variety of different scenarios. But if you are in a world where if it can be seen, it can be hit, and if it can be hit, it can be killed, then you've got to make that transition because unless you can adequately defend those platforms, and by the way, we also have to defend our bases, we have to harden those, make them more resilient, again, improve their defenses, uh, our headquarters around the world, et cetera, uh, particularly in a particular theater. Uh, if you don't do that, again, the vulnerability is going to be very, very high. So. Rather than the, again, thinking of the drones that you see in the sky in Ukraine, which which are, again, quite modest in their capability, their range, their uh, flight time, and so forth, used very effectively, especially by the Ukrainians, who have shown a real facility for integrating their capabilities with precision munitions. Uh, despite that, what we would see in the future is just dramatically different. Again, the ranges the speed, the capabilities, and the sheer number of these will be extraordinary. So you have a book coming out later this year. What's it called and what compelled you to write it? Yeah, the title again is Conflict, uh, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine. Um, I wrote it, frankly, because Andrew Roberts, who I know very well and with whom I've probably done a dozen or so events over the years together at various locations from the New York Historical Society, 
to the Cliveden Literary Festival, to London, you name it. Uh, and, and I have enormous uh, affection, frankly, for him. He's a terrific, uh, he's a phenomenal historian and biographer and also a great guy. Uh, and he came to me a little less than a year ago and proposed this idea. Um, and it really appealed to me. Um, we took turns leading in uh, the drafting of various chapters. I obviously did Iraq and Afghanistan, given my command of both of those wars, also Vietnam, which was the subject of my PhD dissertation. Um, and then we edited back and forth quite intensively what the other did. Um, and it's been very, very interesting and instructive. Um, I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, it'll be published uh, in early October in the UK and mid-October in the United States. Uh, and I think it's going to be very, very stimulating, enjoyable, uh, and so forth to discuss that as it does come out. And it does include a chapter on the future of warfare, which in some respects is, um, you know, a little bit terrifying because at some point in the future, I think warfare will be much more machine on machine than it is man system on man system, much less soldier versus soldier. Well, I absolutely look forward to reading it. And in it, I imagine you discuss hypersonic missiles. Can you speak just a bit about their importance? Well, yeah, that will be one capability. Um, it's already here to some degree. In fact, Russia has used some of these against Ukraine. Uh, it seems a tiny bit of overkill to me. Um, uh, again, the Russian missiles generally are relatively robust and why you need to use something that flies several times the speed of sound. Um, but perhaps it is just a, that they're running out of these other types and they're resorting to these extremely expensive uh, and very capable long range systems. So hypersonics are already present, but nowhere near in the number, um, nor the precision and range that one can expect in the future. Uh, they will shorten decision-making timing when it comes to retaliation, if it were to actually have nuclear systems on them. Um, <clears throat> it creates a real challenge for defenses, depending on how they are able to maneuver and so forth, again, given the extraordinary speed. Um, so they will be among the elements that will be fairly revolutionary in the future, um, noting that the transformation of all elements, again, from generally manned to unmanned, some of which will be remotely piloted, others of which will be algorithmically driven, that's going to be the real transformation. Um, and this is where capabilities such as machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, big data analytics, um, vast networks that connect sensors and shooters, uh, all of this is going to be truly revolutionary. And hypersonics will be one element in that constellation of new capabilities. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Yeah, I think since this is uh, a series that is focused on Ukraine, um, we have to conclude by reiterating how impressive Ukrainian forces and Ukrainian citizens and Ukrainian leaders have been. Uh, and also noting that this is about as right versus wrong as a conflict can get. Uh, this was a an unprovoked invasion. It has been carried out in a particularly brutal manner uh, by forces whose culture seems to be to, to uh, carry out essentially war crimes. It seems to be to actually violate the laws, the accepted norms of land warfare and the Geneva Convention and so forth. Uh, as opposed to units that are trying to adhere to it, and occasionally their soldiers uh, go off from between the right and left limits, like most other armies uh, that are trying to adhere to this very scrupulously. Uh, and in the face of all this, um, Ukrainians have not only won the most critical battles, the especially the Battle of Kyiv, needless to say, since the overall objective of Russia was to topple the government and replace President Zelensky with a pro-Russian figure, but also the battles of Kharkiv and Sumy and Chernihiv and, and uh, Kherson, 
uh, and so forth, um, have fought the Russians to a standstill, largely. They've had very incremental gains uh, in their winter offensive at incredible cost uh, and are poised to achieve, I believe, uh, for the first time in this war, real combined arms uh, operations where you'll see not just tanks, but also tanks supported by infantry and infantry fighting vehicles with artillery and mortars suppressing the enemy defenses, with engineers to dismantle obstacles, EOD to defuse explosives, air defense to keep the enemy's air off, uh, electronic warfare to jam the enemy's command control communications, solid communications and command and control on the Ukrainian side, uh, additional forces right behind the lead elements to exploit the progress, the achievements that they make, uh, which is very important so that when they run out of steam that you have another force to push through them. Uh, unlike, say, in Kharkiv, where at a certain point, the, the capabilities, the forces just gradually culminate uh, because of the sheer physical uh, challenges of pushing, pushing, pushing. You know, at about three days or so, it, our experience in combat was, again, troops just can't go much farther, uh, but also supported by logistics with additional ammunition, uh, food, fuel, uh, water, uh, also medical supplies, and and all, again, very responsive to keep the lead elements going and try to exploit the success that they achieve. Uh, we have not seen the Russians do that. We saw glimpses of this in the Kharkiv offensive last fall from the Ukrainians, but this is going to be vastly more impressive. Uh, I have witnessed combined arms. I was privileged to command forces that, that achieved combined arms effects uh, where you partner again tanks and infantry fighting vehicles and great soldiers and and artillery and attack helicopters and close air support and all the rest of the elements that I just mentioned. Uh, and General Hodges, your, your good colleague of this initiative, uh, was a brigade commander during that time. And when you do that, it is fearsome to the enemy. Uh, it is absolutely intimidating. And if that can get rolling, if it can punch through the uh, defenses in the southeast, south uh, area of Ukraine. I think the Ukrainians can take away that ground line of communications from Russia proper uh, through the southeastern part of the country to Crimea, to begin to isolate Crimea uh, and make the kind of progress that can really threaten uh, the Russians in this war. But again, you can envision this uh, because of the extraordinary professional capabilities, the tenacity, the determination, um, the will, the courage on the battlefield, uh, all of these unbelievable qualities really in, in, in forces uh, that have been so impressive. Um, and touch wood, um, I am very much looking forward to seeing the accomplishments of these Ukrainian forces who are currently in training in Germany and the UK and Poland and Ukraine proper uh, when they're all positioned for the spring and summer offensive. Well, thank you, General Petraeus. It has been fantastic having you um, and hearing all your insights about the war in Ukraine. I'm sure we're all looking forward to your book coming out this October, Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine. Thank you. Privilege to be with you again. Thank you. Thank you.